Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as we play through one entire round, and keep in mind that in the description of this video, you can find a list of all of the main teaching spots along with timestamps to jump right to them. Now, I would like to ask that as you watch this, if you end up enjoying it, that you please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel, you can do so by going to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with cool benefits like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, the game is fully set up and ready to play for our two different players. Now, before we move on, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I show you the game, and that will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. The next thing I'd like to mention is the fact that today I am filming with a prototype version of this game, so the art and components are not necessarily what you'll find in the final version. Well, let's start things off with an overview of this fully cooperative game. Each player is in charge of a faction that has its own individual strengths and weaknesses, and we are going to have to collaborate because we win or lose this game together. As you can see, each player has a home territory, and in the center of the board there is the Imperial Capital. Now, the Empire used to rule the entire world with an iron fist, but now certain factions are leading uprisings against the Empire. Now, the Empire is not happy about that, so they will start summoning legions that are going to try and seek out the havens of each of the factions to try and wipe them out and re-enslave those peoples. At the same time this internal conflict rages, a new danger has appeared from beyond the frozen seas in the form of the Hordes of Chaos, who bring undead and monsters which will leave curses in their wake. The Hordes of Chaos have an insatiable hunger to bring ruin to the entire world, which means they will not only attack the player factions, but also the Empire as well. This means players not only have to lead uprisings against the Empire, but also need to keep the Hordes of Chaos in check before they ruin the entire world. Now the players are going to do this by recruiting units out on the map that they can then move in to attack the Nemesis forces. Combat is resolved through a series of quick dice rolling phases, and each of the player's forces as well as the Nemesis forces detail which dice they roll in combat. Now you may have noticed that each of the player factions has a hero token on their home territory. Now that hero is controlled by the players and it is leading the uprising, and as we play through the game we are going to use our action points in order to do a variety of different options, which will let us move our heroes throughout the territory, explore various tiles by flipping them up, we can also send our heroes onto quests, and we can use these actions to move our units to fight the Nemesis forces. The overall structure of the game is split into a series of chapters, and within each chapter we are going to play through seven phases. At the start of the game, players have to decide if they want to play a two-chapter introductory game, a three-chapter standard game, or a four-chapter epic game. Players also have to set the difficulty of the game, and they can do that with the chapter levels. In a standard game, you go 1, 2, 3, and then 4, but if you want to make the game easier, you can bring in more of the lower level events, and you can make the game harder by putting in more of the higher level events. Players can also increase the complexity of the game by shuffling in the advanced events, advanced quests, and advanced enemies into each of those associated stacks. Now, as we go through the game, players will generate victory points from a variety of different sources, but so will the Hordes of Chaos and the Empire. Once we have completed the final chapter of the game, as long as every player has more victory points than both the Hordes of Chaos and the Empire, then the players will win, but if even one player has equal to or less than the number of points of one of the two Nemesis factions, then all of the players lose. Well, it's now time for us to start playing the game, and that means we are starting the first chapter. Now, as I said before, each chapter has seven different phases in it, and for this tutorial, I am actually going to be starting off in the fourth phase of the first chapter. So I'm going to take care of all of this off screen, and we will start here. And don't worry, I will cover how the first three phases work once we finish the first chapter of the game. After going through those three phases, we now have a revealed event, a couple of horde tokens out on the board and their associated information cards, and we can also see that both of the players have spent their resources to deploy units onto their home territories. This means we can now start the action phase of the chapter, and that says that we will each take actions until all players have passed. So, the person who has the starting player token can now take the first action of the game, and that is going to be the red player over here. Now, as you can see on each player board, there is an area that shows the different actions, and we also have eight of these action points up on top. 
Now, whenever you take an action, you must take one of these available tokens and place them down onto the action that you would like to take. In this case, the red player decides they would like to move. So let's focus on the action, and it says move your hero to an adjacent hex, even if it is unexplored. Your hero can cross impassable terrain. Currently, the red player's hero is in their home territory, so now they can move to any of the adjacent hexes around it. In this case, they have decided they would like to move over here into this unexplored hex. So we are done with our move action, and as you can see, it has an infinity symbol, which means this action does not necessarily end our turn. As you can see down here, the trade action also has that symbol, but none of the other five actions do, and whenever you perform any of these, after you finish the action, your turn is done. In the case of move and trade, however, we could end our turn now, or we could take another action. Now, I think let's do that. In this case, let's do the explore action, and it says, if your hero's hex is unexplored and it has no curse, then we can flip it and then resolve its effects. So let's focus back on the map, and as you can see, this is an unexplored hex where the red player's hero is, and it does not have a curse. These tokens right over here are curse tokens, so if that was on top of this unexplored hex, obviously the hero would not be able to explore it. That is not the case though, so we can flip this hex over, and now we have to resolve its effects. As you can see, we found an Imperial Slave Mine, and it says we have to remove any skeletons here. Now, this is what the skeletons look like, and it's possible that the skeleton could have been on this hex before it was flipped over, so if there had been one there, then after flipping, this would have simply removed that skeleton. Now, obviously, that was not the case, and the next thing that it says is we have to place two garrisons here. Well, these are garrison pieces, and as you can see, there are three different types. Whenever you put the first garrison into a hex, you use the base, and then if you are to add a second garrison onto that hex, you take one of the second level pieces and you slot it in on top. So this is effectively two garrisons, and as you can see, if you have to put a third garrison on top, you put this topper right there. And if you were ever to add another garrison to a hex after it already has three, then the Imperial faction will simply gain one victory point. In this case, we have to place two garrisons down, so we can place this onto that hex. So they can place that over here, and these garrisons signify that the Empire currently controls this region. The next thing it says is the red player has to roll their hero dice, and they will gain one plunder for every hit they roll. Each other player is going to gain one plunder. So let's focus on their hero card, and on the bottom it shows the various attributes that that hero has. In this case, Ka'al the Destroyer has three might, zero magic, one leadership, and zero guile. Now, whenever you roll hero dice, you roll dice that match these colors, so they are going to roll three red dice and one blue die, and it's worth noting that if you ever roll dice for Guile, for each one of those, you have to decide if you want to roll a white or an orange die. Now, as you can see, each die color in the game has different result possibilities, and the red dice are pretty good at rolling skulls, so this is a good event for Ka'al the Destroyer. So, they have to roll the dice, and it looks like they got three skulls total. So that means Ka'al found three plunder at the Imperial Slave Mines. So they can take three plunder from the supply, and remember this hex said that all other players will gain one plunder, so the blue player will gain this. The final part of an explore action involves deciding what orientation the revealed hex is going to have. As you can see, this hex has impassable terrain on four out of its six sides, and no unit in the game, whether that be the players, Imperials, or the Chaos factions, can cross over this impassable terrain. Now we do know that the heroes can move over impassable terrain, and that's because the player heroes are technically not units. Now I think what we want to do is spin this like that, because we have all of these units right here, and I think we want to move them in over here and try to attack the garrison later on in this chapter. As it was before, there was impassable terrain stopping that from happening, but now we have a clear shot to command these units into the Imperial Slave Mines. Alright, the explore action is done, and since this action does not have an infinity symbol, that means the red player's turn is done, and play will now move over to the blue player. After considering their options, the blue player has decided to start with a quest action. So let's focus on it, and it says you choose a quest, and then roll your hero dice. You solve the quest if you succeed at enough of the quest goals. So blue can focus on the quest area, and at the start of each chapter, there will be three quests available. Now they have to select one of these to go on, and they've decided to try and complete Deepling Allies. Now that they've made their selection, they have to read the bottom of the quest card, because there might be a conditional benefit they could take advantage of. In this case, it says if your hero is on a Highland Hex, they can roll one more red die. 
Well, as you can see, that is the Highland icon, and the blue player's home territory is Highlands, and they have not moved their hero out just yet. So that means this is the case, so they have an advantage in completing this Deepling Allies quest while being on this Highlands card. So they will roll plus one red die, so they can add this into their die rolling pool, and now they have to roll their hero dice, which again means they take dice of the corresponding colors equal to their attributes. That means they gain one red, one purple for the magic, one blue for the leadership, and then they could take a white or an orange die for the guile, and they've decided to go with orange. So they can add these into their die rolling pool. And now I'd like to bring your attention to this card down here. Now this is a feat card, and every one of the different heroes has two starting feats, and then in one of the earlier phases in the chapter, each player was able to draw a new one. Now I'll describe how that happens later on in the tutorial, but this is the feat that the blue player decided to go with. It is called Magic, and it says always, your hero gains plus one magic. So that means instead of having one magic total, they have two, so they will roll another purple die. As you can see, on each of these feats, there are icons in the top left corner, which indicate when that feat is applicable. So both of these are hourglasses, which means they are always applicable given certain circumstances. And then this one over here is only applicable during the archery and clash phase of combat. Likewise, the red player has this feat card, and that is only usable during the actions phase. With that in mind, let's look at the specifics of the Elder feat that Yanni got to start with, and it says they will always add one die of any color to any of the rolls outside of combat. Now, this is a die roll that is not in combat, so that means they can add any one of these dice into the pool. Now, they could go with the black die if they want to have the best odds at getting lots of the hits, and they could also go with another purple die if they are trying to get more of these lightning bolts. Now, they can look over here and see that the quest card has three different goals. One is to get to four hits, one is to show one shield, and the other one is two of these lightning bolts. Now, they would really like to get to four hits, so they've decided to bring a black die in for their Elder Feet ability. Well, that is a bunch of dice, and now it's time for them to be rolled. So let's see how they did. Now, at this point, we have to add up each of the different die face options. In this case, that is one, two, three, four, five, six of the skulls, which are hits. They also have one, two, three of the lightning bolts, and they have no shields. Now, they can compare these results to the goals on the quest card. And as you can see, they have four or more hits, and they also have two or more of the lightning bolts. That means they have completed two of these goals, and in order to succeed at this quest, they just needed to complete one of the three overall goals. So they did more than they needed to overall. Now, whenever you complete one of these goals, as long as you succeeded in the overall quest, you also get the associated sub-reward. So because they were able to get to four or more hits, they are going to gain one victory point. They can track this up here, so they now have the first victory point of the game. After that, since they were able to solve this quest, they can perform all of the actions on the solve side. Obviously, if they did not get one or more of these goals, then they would fail and perform these actions here. In this case, it says the blue player can take this card, and they may ignore the terrain effect of Highland Hexes for the rest of the game. Now, they can place this over here, and I'll describe the Highland Hex terrain effect later on in the tutorial. Alright, that's finished up the blue player's action, which means it's once again time for the red player to go. Now, they have to select an action, and it's worth noting that you are allowed to do the same action multiple times within a chapter, and there is no benefit or penalty for doing so. In this case, the red player decides they would like to do a command action, and this says they have to pay one food. After that, they are going to choose an explored hex out on the map, and then they can move any of their adjacent units up to a maximum of five onto that hex. In addition to this, you can send your hero, and remember your hero is not a unit, so it does not count as part of that maximum. It also reminds us that units cannot cross impassable terrain. And then we have to choose any explored hex on the map to move units to. Now, it's worth noting these frozen sea spots around the outside are explored, so we can move our units into those, but obviously these are unexplored, so we cannot move our units there. In this case, I think we want to move our units into the Imperial Slave Mines, so let's select this area, and obviously our hero is already there, so we don't have to move them. Now, once again, after we've selected this, we can take up to five units from any of the adjacent spots to the selected area and then move them in. In this case, we have five units at our home territory, so let's move in with all five of these. 
Before we move on, there is one more command restriction, and that is that you are never allowed to have one player's units in the same hex as another one of the players. We might be allied together and winning and losing together, but we don't completely trust each other just yet, so we have to avoid each other's hexes. It is worth noting that the player heroes can share the same space because, once again, they are not units. Well, we are now done commanding, and whenever there are units from two different factions in the same hex, there will then be combat, which will last until all of one of the side's units are destroyed. In this case, the red player's units are now attacking the Imperial Slave Mines, and they are going to be going against two Imperial Garrisons. Now, technically, the fighting has not started just yet, because the first phase of combat is called Before Combat. In this phase, we have to check to see if there is a terrain effect on this combat. In this case, we are fighting in a Highlands Hex, so we can look down here and see that when fighting in the Highlands, each of the factions will only roll one die during the archery round of the combat. This is also time to check the feats and see if any of them say before combat. As you can see, the red player has an after combat feat and an archery round feat, but none for before combat, which means it's now time to move into the archery round of combat. Now, I've moved all of the units over here so that it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. And as you can see, we have two of these Deadeye units, which are archery units. We know that because printed on our player board, it shows the archery symbol here and says archer down below, whereas our other units are tribesmen, which just show the clash round symbol. Now, the way the archery round normally works is each of the factions will simultaneously roll all of their archery dice. As you can see, when there are two garrisons, they are going to roll two of the white dice, and we have two of the Deadeye units over here, and each of those show a white die on them. So under normal circumstances, we would roll two white dice, and so would the Imperials. Now in this case, we are fighting in the Highlands, and that means each faction can roll only one die during the ranged phase, so that means in this case, each of us will roll just one white die. The rolls are simultaneous, so this will be ours, and then this will be for the Empire. And now we can evaluate the rolls. In our case, we got a blank, which obviously does nothing. But then over here, the Empire rolled a hit as well as a shield. With that in mind, we can look to our dice cheat sheet, and it says that skulls are damage. Each unit can take only one skull of damage. And then over here for shields, it says that each shield will cancel one skull from your enemy. That means if we had rolled a hit, then the shield on the Empire side would have absorbed it. In this case, though, that shield is not doing anything. Now that skull is going to do one damage to us, which means we are going to lose one of these units, and I think we'll lose one of these dead eyes. The way we do this is we place the defeated unit into the Imperial Graveyard, because of course the Empire is the ones who destroyed this unit. Now I'll describe the details of this area later, and at this point the archery round of combat is done. That means we can move into the clash round, and the way this works is we simply add up all of the dice for all of our units, including the units in the archery round, and we simultaneously roll. In this case, we have three tribesmen and one dead eyes, so we will roll three orange dice and one white. So far so good with a shield and two of these skulls, and simultaneously the Empire is going to roll two yellow, one white, and one blue die, because they have two garrisons, so that is the row they activate. Well, we'll see how they do. And it looks like they actually got the same results that we did. Now, we each have two skulls and one shield, so that means our shield will block one of those two skulls, and we have to take one hit. In this case, I think we will lose a tribesman. And then over here for the Empire, we have two hits coming in, and they block one, so they take one damage, which means one of the garrisons will be destroyed. So we can remove this piece, and we'll put the tribesman into the Imperial Graveyard. That has completed one clash round, and if at this point there are still units from two different factions, then we go into another clash round, and it's worth noting there is no way for units to retreat. So we now see that we are going to roll two orange dice and one yellow die, and now the Empire will only roll a blue and a white die because they have just one garrison in this fight now. We can now take damage, and it appears we are both doing one, and there were no shields, so we are going to lose another unit, and I figure we'll go with the tribesmen, and then we will do another damage to the Empire, which will destroy their last remaining garrison in that hex. So the tribesmen will go to the Imperial Graveyard, and now that there is just one faction's units on this hex, the clash round is over, and we can move into the after combat round. At this point, the active player is going to get one victory point for every garrison they destroyed, as well as every skeleton that they destroyed. Obviously, there were no skeletons in this combat, though, so the red player will gain two victory points. 
This will bring them up to two total. As always, we have to check to see if any of the hero feats are activatable, and it's worth noting that these can be tied to your hero. If it says on your hero's hex, then you can only use this feat on that hero's location. In this case, the Ka'al is in that same hex, and they have Pillage, which is an after-combat effect. It says if you have one or more units here, you gain two resources. In this case, Red wants two salt, and it's worth noting they did not use their Warg's feat during the archery phase because they did not have two or more of their Warg units in that battle. In fact, they had zero of them. All right, the Red player is done with their action. So the Blue player can go, and they want to move their hero. And in this case, they are going to head onto this unexplored hex. After that, they would like to explore the hex, so they can flip it over and then resolve its effects. In this case, it says Torment, and the blue player immediately gains 3 salt. After that, it says if empty, place 1 skeleton here, and it was empty because, again, the hero does not count as a unit to occupy that. So one skeleton is going to appear on that hex, and it says if not, they would reinforce here. Now what that means is if there was already a skeleton there, they would add another one, or if there was already a garrison there, they would add a garrison instead. The last thing they have to do is place two skeletons with other skeletons out on the board. As you can see, there are currently three skeletons out on the board, but I just realized there actually should be more. With that in mind, I'd like to draw your attention over here to these two horde cards. Each of these were drawn as part of the event phase that happened earlier on in this chapter, and they each have an immediate effect, which I have not done just yet. Now we can see the Bloodworm over here says they have to place one curse onto a hex that does not have an X, so this means this should have been placed down immediately when the Bloodworm was placed. In this case, we probably would have put the curse right over there. Uh, it could not have gone onto these spots because they already have an X on it. The other effect was for the Counter of Omens, and it says we should have placed two skeletons onto the same spot as that Horde token. So technically, both of these skeletons should have been on this hex for a little while. Sorry about missing that earlier. So let's come back to the Torment effect, and we have to place two skeletons where there are already skeletons. Now, it's important to note that if there are ever three skeletons in the same hex, at that moment, all three of them will be returned to the supply, and a new Horde card will be revealed from the top of the stack, and we will place a new token associated with it down onto the board. Now, these are much harder to kill than the skeletons, so it's important for us to try and not let three of these be on the same spot. It's also worth noting that if we ever have to place a skeleton and there aren't enough in the supply, then in that moment we will clear all the skeletons off from one hex on the board and then summon a horde token onto that spot. Now with that in mind, we obviously don't want to place one over here, and we don't want to place both of these into a spot that already has a skeleton, so I think we'll put one right over here and one over there. That's finished up the blue player's turn, so now red can go. And they have decided to do a haven action. As you can see, they have to pay 3 plunder, and if there is no curse, enemy unit, haven, or X on the hero's explored hex, they can place one of their havens down. It's worth noting that havens normally just cost 2 plunder, but for the red faction, the havens are a little bit more expensive. The red hero is currently on the Imperial Slave Mines, and there is indeed no curse, enemy units, haven, or X on the spot. So that means they can spend the 3 plunder and then place their next haven from the left-hand side onto that hex. So they can place this over here, and it's worth noting that you can only make new units on hexes that already have a haven, and the havens will also generate resources and victory points for the players, and I'll explain the details of how that works later on. Alright, that was a quick turn for the red player, so now blue can go. And they have decided to go to the market. When we focus in, it says gain one item from the market that your hero can use according to their attributes by paying its salt cost. So we have to keep in mind that Yanni the Hunter has one might, two magic, one leadership, and one guile, and they also have four salt available to them. It's worth noting that at any time for a free action, players are allowed to get rid of three of one type of resource to gain one of a different type, but you are not allowed to mix and match with this trade-in. So Blue can focus over on the market where there will always be three items available. Now each of these items has a salt cost listed on the bottom, and some of them have an attribute requirement. So in order to take this Leviathan Harpoon, that hero must have three or more might, and over here for the Drums of Terror, that hero must have two or more magic. Now this one over here does not have a requirement, and we know that Yanni has two magic and one might. So they can equip this, but not that one, and they have decided to take the Drums of Terror. 
Now that is going to cost three salt, which they do have, and now they can place this into their area. Now before we talk about the specifics of this item, I would like to talk about the trade action. Now this has an infinity symbol on it, so it can be used multiple times in a turn. And this action is special because you can actually take it when it's not even the action phase. When you do a trade action, you immediately gain one salt for that action token. And it also says that heroes that are on the same location can swap resources as well as items as long as the receiving hero can use the item that is given. Now, this is one way to gain salt if you don't have enough of it, but of course, you are losing out on other action options for that chapter. In this case, Yanni was obviously able to pay this salt with no problem, and now we can look down here where this item says that it is going to activate during the clash phase. It says if your enemy's dice shows one or more blanks, then the blue player is going to gain one shield, and this activates before damage, and it only will happen, of course, on the hero's hex. Now it's worth noting that this card looks a lot like the feats, and that's important because each player has a hand limit of no more than 10 feats and items combined. So right now, Yanni has four of these, and that means they could take six more feats or items later on in the game. The final thing they have to do is immediately draw another item for the market. In this case, that is a Wormsicle, and it is activated during the Clash phase. It says if you have two or more blanks after you roll, you will gain one Lightning Bolt symbol. Don't worry, I'll explain what these Bolt symbols do later on in the tutorial. Well, blue is done, so now the red player can go and they have decided to start with a move action for their hero. This means they can move to any of these adjacent spots, including crossing over the impassable terrain because the hero is not a unit. Now, in this case, they've decided to head over here onto this unexplored tile, and I'm sure you've noticed the back of this tile is different than the other unexplored tiles. Now, this is a C tower tile, and there are two of them in the game, and these were put specifically onto these spots as part of setup. Red is done moving, and they can now take another action if they want to, and they have decided to explore the C Tower tile they are on. This means they can flip this tile over, and then, of course, resolve its effects. Now, the first thing to note is up along the top, there are specific rules that are the same for every single C Tower in the game. It says that units and heroes on this C Tower spot are adjacent to every hex on the board. If your hero is on this spot, then you pay one less salt for the items on the market when you purchase them. That means from this C Tower spot, we could move our hero to literally any other hex on the board, and if we had units on this C Tower, we could command them onto any hex on the entire board. So obviously these C Tower locations are very powerful for moving your units around, especially if you can build a haven on top of it, because of course you construct units on havens, and then you can later command those units onto any hex in the game. With that in mind, we can now read the specifics of this tile here, and it says this is Dawnguard. It starts by saying the red player will now gain two salt, and then it says that any skeletons on the spot will be removed. After that, two garrisons are going to be placed on top of this location, which of course means we put a two-layer garrison down on top of it. Now the last thing that the red player can do is rotate this, and I do think it makes sense to rotate it like that, so that their units over here at the Imperial Slave Mine can move onto the spot to try and destroy the garrison, which would uh, clear the way for the red player to potentially be able to build a haven on the spot, which again would be really good. Alright, red is done, so now blue can go. And they have decided to do another quest action. This means they can select from the two remaining quests. You may have noted we did not automatically draw a new quest when we completed one earlier on. These are only refreshed at the start of each of the chapters. Now, as you can see, this quest over here says Strike at Dawn, and they would only have to complete one of these three goals. But over here for Druid Sacrifice, they would have to complete two out of these three goals in order to be successful. Now, Yanni is quite good at completing quests, but they have decided that this is going to be a more important quest for them right now, so this is the one they've decided to go on. The first thing they do is check to see if they get a bonus. It says that if your hero is on a hex with a legion or a horde, they roll one more purple die. Now, this is a horde, but the uh, blue player's hero is not on a spot with them, and this is what the legion looks like. Uh, we haven't seen the legions just yet, and that's because these don't come out in the first chapter of the game unless you are using advanced components. Next up, they have to build their die pool, which is going to be one red, two purple, one blue, and then one white or orange. In this case, they've decided to go with white, and then, of course, their elder feet will activate, which lets them add any one die to this roll. 
Now they have decided in this case, they would like to add another blue. That gives them the most odds at getting a shield or one of these skulls. It's true that the black can get them a lot more skulls, but they feel like it's better to aim for getting another shield. So they can roll the dice, and it looks like they got three skulls and two shields. Uh, they did not get any of the bolts on these dice. Now, three skulls is not enough to complete this goal, but two shields is obviously more than enough to complete the middle one, which just needed the one. Now, in order to complete this quest, they just needed to complete one of these three goals, so this is a success, and they were able to complete the middle one, and that says they can draw a new quest once they've finished completing this one. Speaking of that, they can now resolve the success part of this quest, and it says that one legion or horde is going to lose two threat, and then this quest will be discarded. Now with that in mind, we can look over here, and there are currently two hordes out on the map, and we don't have any legions just yet. Now each of these hordes has a clip on the side, and that indicates how much threat they currently have. Each of them is currently at the four spot, so that means they can lower this down to two for one of them. Now, it does look like Blue is wanting to attack the Bloodworm later on in this chapter, so they are going to use this Strike at Dawn in order to lower the threat by two. Now, this is important because you defeat one of these hordes or legions as soon as their threat is reduced to zero, so they effectively just did two damage to this horde. The last thing they have to do is draw a new quest, so let's see what this one says. It says Nether Sea Navigators, and it down below says if you succeed at it, every player will gain one resource for each of the shields and bolts that you rolled, and then you discard this. So this is a pretty good way to gain resources. All right, blue is done, so now red can go. And with one of their two remaining actions, they've decided to go to the market. Remember, their hero is currently at a sea tower, so that means they get a discount of one salt when they go to the market. And Ka'al does have three might. So when they get over here, they have decided to purchase this Leviathan Harpoon, and that's going to cost them four salt. Although the discount means they only have to spend three. After that, we can immediately replace that item. And now Ka'al can add this item to their hand. This is the Leviathan Harpoon, and it says during the clash round of combat, they can turn one of their dice to show a single hit, block, or bolt, and they do this before damage is dealt, but after the dice are rolled. Now, it does say this can only be done once per round, and that means once per clash round. If there are multiple clash rounds within a given combat, they can continue to use this Leviathan Harpoon in each of them. All right, that's finished their turn, so blue can go. And they have decided to command. So that is going to cost them one food. And then they are going to target Torment over here, which means they can bring up to five adjacent units into this zone. Now they have five units on their home territory, so they're going to bring all five of them over. And after that happens, we can see that there are both the player units as well as the chaos units in the spot. So now there will be combat. In this case, they are fighting against one skeleton. And we can see that the Torment location is an ice waste terrain. When we look down here, we can see that there is no effect when fighting in the ice waste. And while we're down here, let's take a look at the other effects that are possible. If you're fighting in the woods, then during the archery phase, both of the factions can re-roll up to two of their dice. If the uh, faction is chaos or legion, then you only re-roll blanks in this case. Now, if there is a curse on a region, then that means that terrain is cursed no matter what the actual tile says. Now, in that case, it says that only the Chaos Faction can use the Bolt, which, again, I haven't described just yet, but I will very soon. Now, next up in the Marshes, during the Archery and Clash rounds, any red dice are going to become white dice instead. And finally, if you are fighting in the Badlands, then during the Archery phase, any unit that is a Rider style can add their dice to the Archery phase as well. For instance, for the red player, their wargs are riders, but not archers. But of course, if you're in the Badlands, then these wargs can also fight in the archery phase. Speaking of the archery phase, that is where we are at. As you can see, the blue player has two of these spear singers, which are going to throw one white die in the archery phase. Now with these skeletons, if there is just one of them, then they are going to roll a red die during the clash phase. But as you can see, no matter how many skeletons there are, they never throw dice in the range phase. Obviously, you will never fight more than two skeletons, because if there are ever three skeletons on a spot, they are removed and turn into a horde. So, let's see how the Spearsingers do. In this case, they got one blank and one shield. 
Shields are normally nice to see, but in this case, there are no opposing hits coming in, so this is effectively no hits. So the archery phase is done, and now combat will move into the clash phase. This means the blue player is going to roll two white dice and three blue for their units, and simultaneously this one skeleton will roll one red die. So let's first see how the blue player does. They got two shields as well as two skulls. And at the same time, the skeleton got to roll the red die, and they got a hit as well as one bolt. Next up, it's time to deal damage. The skeleton is doing one damage, and we have two shields, so that easily absorbs that. And then we are doing two damage, and the skeleton did not get any shields. That means the skeleton is destroyed. But then down below, we can see for the skeletons, whenever they roll a bolt on their dice, you place one skeleton here after damage is dealt. And of course, if there are three skeletons on this hex at this point, it now turns into a horde. Now, combat is still happening, so a new skeleton comes out. And if this turned into a horde, then suddenly you would be fighting the horde instead of the skeletons. Now, at this point, the clash rounds are going to continue because there are still units from two of these factions. But before we proceed with the rest of this combat, I would like to talk about what happens when a player rolls a bolt. Now, you're only going to get bolts when you are rolling the red or the purple magic dice. And in that case, you're going to look out to the board to a druid card. Now, there are four of these druid cards around the board, and you put one of them out for every chapter you are planning on playing in that game. Now, as part of the earlier phases of this chapter, one of these druids was revealed, and each druid gives us a bolt ability that we can use for the rest of the game. So that means right now the only one we have is Shapeshifter, and it says during the archery and clash round, you gain one resource shown on this hex every time you activate a bolt. Now, it's worth noting that instead of doing that bolt ability, you can cancel one shield that is coming in from the opposing side. So you can use your bolts to make your hits even more impactful if you want. Now, obviously, as you play through more chapters, more of these druids will be revealed, so the bolts will have more and more options available to you as you get deeper in the game. So let's come back to this combat, and the blue player got, wow, quite a few hits over there. That was a really good roll overall. Next up, the skeleton is going to go, and they got one hit. It's worth noting, if they had a blank, then the blue player could have used their drums of terror item they got, which of course says if there's one or more blanks on the enemy, then blue could get another shield. But in this case, that was not necessary, obviously. Uh, this is one damage coming in, but they have three shields to easily block that. And then blue is doing three damage back, so that means that this skeleton is destroyed. And now that all of the opposing units are gone, the clash part is done, so now it's the after combat phase, and the blue player will get one point for every skeleton they destroyed, so blue will get two points, bringing them up to three. Well, blue is done, so now red can go, and they have one action left. In this case, they have decided to go on a quest. And in particular, they would like to do the Nether Sea Navigator's quest. Uh, the Druid Sacrifice does look pretty good because if you succeed, you can remove a curse. And in general, these are very hard to remove from the board. You have to have specific things like this quest. But in this case, currently the red player's hero is at a sea tower. And down below it says if the hero's at a sea tower, then they can roll one more purple die. Uh, they also like the idea of getting some resources, so this is the one they're going to try. So they can build their die pool out, and they have three might and one leadership. So that is three red and one blue, and then of course one purple from this bonus down here from the sea tower. So they can roll all of the dice, and let's see here. They got two hits and three bolts, which means they do succeed because they just had to complete one of the top, and one bolt was enough to make that happen. Uh, they did not roll any shield, which is a bit of a bummer. And we can see, since they got at least one bolt, they can discard any items from the market to then draw new ones if they want. Now, they have succeeded at this quest, so it says that uh, every player is going to get one resource for every shield and bolt rolled, and they rolled three bolts and no shields. So that means every player will get three resources, which is a pretty good outcome overall. Players can mix and match these resources, but they've both decided just to take three salt at this point. And then the last thing they could do is optionally discard items from the market, but the red player is fine with those. They don't think anyone's going back to the market this round. All right, the blue player can go, and they have decided to build a haven. This is going to cost them two plunder, and then they can place this out as long as there is no curse, enemy units, haven, or X on the hero's current unexplored hex. Currently, none of those restrictions are in place, so they can put this haven right over here. 
and that's finished their turn. This means red can go, but they have no more actions, so they are going to pass. At this point, they could potentially use any feats if those happen to make sense in this moment. For instance, they do have a discard feat over here during the action phase, but they have decided not to use that, so that means play comes right back over to the blue player. Now, for their last action of the chapter, they have decided to command their units which means they could select a hex and then move them in, and they would like to attack this bloodworm. So they will select this screaming C hex and then move up to five of their units in, and they can also bring their hero, and they have decided to do that. So combat will start, and as you can see, the screaming C is an ice waste, which does not have any terrain effects in combat. Once again, the threat is also the amount of hits that it's going to take to defeat this horde. So in this case, it will be two hits overall to win this combat. Now we can start off with the archery phase. So the Spear Singers can roll. And they got a shield and a blank. Now we can see the Bloodworm at threat level 2 is going to roll just one red level die. Remember, the blue player was able to lower this threat by 2 earlier on from a quest. And if they hadn't, the Bloodworm would roll two red dice now. So let's see how the Bloodworm goes, and they got a Lightning Bolt as well as a Skull. Next up, it's the Deal Damage phase, and the one damage from the Bloodworm will be blocked by the Shield. Now there is a Bolt, and when these Bolts are rolled by the Horde, they get to do specific actions that are listed on their cards. In this case, it says the Bloodworm will place one curse onto this Hex after damage is dealt. So they will take one curse from the Supply, and then place it down into their current Hex. It's worth noting that no Hex can ever have more than one curse, so if the Chaos Hordes ever try to add a curse where there already is one, then instead they just gain one victory point. Alright, it's now time for the Clash round, so that means the blue player will roll three blue and two white dice. And it's nice seeing a hit, but overall that was not a very good roll. After that, the Bloodworm is going to roll two red dice. So let's see how they do, and they got a double hit. At this point, Yanni can use the Drums of Terror, which says if the enemy's dice show one or more blanks, then the blue player will get one shield as long as Yanni is in this combat, and that is the case. So fortunately, this blank turns into a shield, so now when damage is dealt, the Bloodworm will do one damage, and the blue player will do one damage back. This means the Bloodworm's threat is going to go down to one, and then one of these units must be destroyed. Now we can look over here because we are going to lose a unit that rolls a white die or a blue die. And in general, I think blue dice are better in this combat. Remember, these Spear Singers do get to activate in an archery phase. But at this point, it's important, I think, to mitigate our damage as much as possible and do as much damage as we can. So one Spear Singer will be destroyed. And just like we saw before with the Imperials, whenever the Chaos destroys any opposing units, those go into the Chaos Graveyard. All right, let's now move into the next clash phase. So there are only going to be three blue dice and one white die rolled, and that was a much better roll overall. After that, we can see the Bloodworm is only going to roll one red die, and they got a blank. Wow, okay, that worked out really well. Uh, the Bloodworm does no damage over here, and blue is doing two damage back. So that means they are going to lower the threat down to zero. Now, as soon as that happens, the horde is destroyed, and we can see down below each of the horde have a specific reward when destroyed. In this case, the Bloodworm will give the blue player four victory points, and in the case of the Counter of Omens, it will give that player just two victory points and then actually place two skeletons down. So in this case, the Bloodworm is much better from a victory points perspective. So the Bloodworm has been defeated, and the blue player can take their four points, which is going to bring them up to seven. After that, whenever a horde or legion are destroyed, they are removed entirely from the game, and it's worth noting, if you ever try to summon another one and you don't have enough on the stack, then that enemy faction simply gains one victory point. At this point, the blue player's turn is done, and we can see that every action point token has been used for all of the players. This means the action phase of the chapter has come to an end, which means we can now move into the nemesis phase. This says that we activate legions and hordes once for each activation token on them, and we do this in initiative order from lowest to highest. In this case, there are no legions out and just one horde, and that means this is the only one that will activate. Now, the initiative number is in the top left corner, so for instance, if the Bloodworm had not been defeated, then it would go at initiative 29, whereas the Counter of Omens is at 24, so the Counter of Omens would complete their activation before we would move on to the Bloodworm. 
Now, in this case, there is just one activation to happen, and as you can see, there is one activation token on top of it. Then that Horde or Legion, as an example, would activate as many times as they have tokens on them. So the Counter of Omens will now activate, and the first thing we have to do is remove one activation token from it. The next thing that happens is a Curse token will be placed into the Hex, where the Horde currently is. Next up, the Horde is going to move into an adjacent Hex, and it must go into a Hex that is not farther away from the capital than they currently are. In this case, all of these Hexes are the same or closer, so in an example, if it was over here, it could not move backwards. Now, it is over here, so that means it's going to move into one of these four hexes, and the next thing that we have to check is to see if any of these hexes have a player haven in them. If that was the case, then that is the hex that the horde would move into, but we don't have that happening here. So the next thing we check is which of these hexes has the least number of units. Now, in this case, that is going to be enemy units, and there are only enemy units on this hex here. Now, in this case, that is this double garrison of the Empire. Remember, our hero is not a unit. If there had been a tie between two hexes that have the same number of enemy units, then the players can decide where the horde will go. In this case, that is not what's happening, so the Counter of Omens is going to move into Dawnguard, and then combat will happen because there are units from two different factions on this spot. It does not matter that neither of them are controlled by the players. Now this combat is happening in an ice waste terrain, so there are no terrain effects, and that means it's time for archery. So we can see the counter of omens is at a threat level of 4, and that means they are going to roll 3 white dice. Next up, these two garrisons will roll 2 white dice in the archery phase. And now we can see the garrisons have 2 shields, which absorb the 1 damage easily, and the counter of omens has 1 shield, which absorbs this 1 damage. So the archery phase did not affect either of them, and now it's time for the clash phase. So the double garrisons are going to roll a blue, 2 orange, and a white, and over here the counter of omens is going to roll 2 orange, 2 blue, and 1 purple die. This happens simultaneously, but we can start by seeing what the counter of omens does. And simultaneously, the garrisons were rolling these dice. So the garrisons are doing 2 damage over here to the Counter of Omens, which drops their threat down to 2, and then the Counter of Omens is doing 3 damage back to the garrisons. Now that is going to destroy the garrisons, and there is also a bolt on this die, and that says that the Counter of Omens is going to place 2 skeletons onto an empty hex. This happens after damage and only once per round. If more bolts were rolled, then instead those bolts would simply cancel out the shields rolled by their opponent. So that means two skeletons will be put down onto an empty hex, and the players can decide. And in this case, we figure we'll put them over there, where the blue player should hopefully be able to clean those up without too much of a problem in the next chapter. And of course, each one of these will turn into a victory point when they are destroyed. Well, the Counter of Omens did destroy both of these garrisons, which means these will be put into the Chaos Graveyard, just like any player faction pieces that were destroyed by Chaos. Well, the Counter of Omens is now done activating, and we have no more Horde or Legion cards to activate. I would like to briefly show you what the Legion cards look like. As you can see, they work the same way as the Horde. The main way that they differ is in how they activate, and I'll describe the details of how that works later on in the tutorial. This means the Nemesis phase is done, and we can now move into the Production phase. This says that each player is going to gain resources based on the total number of havens they have built, and we are also going to gain resources shown on every hex that has one of our havens on them. This means the red player will gain two plunder because they have a haven on this Imperial Slave Mine, and then at their home territory they do have a haven, and that will give them one of each resource. So they get three plunder, one salt, and one food from those hexes, and then down here we look to the spot that is the farthest right empty haven location, and we take all of those resources. So with two havens out, the red player will gain one more salt, one plunder, and four food. Likewise, the blue player will gain two salt from Torment, because they have a haven there, and then one of each type from their home territory which means they get three salt, one plunder, and one food, and then down here they gain one salt, one food, and four plunder for having two havens out. It's worth noting that Legion and Chaos forces, as well as curses, can destroy havens, and if all of your havens are destroyed, then these are the resources you will generate in production. 
Now that production is done, we can move into the scoring phase. The first thing that happens is the Empire is going to score points. They will get one point for every hex that has at least one garrison. They will get one point for every legion that is currently in play. And they will get two points for every faction that is currently in the Imperial Graveyard. Well, there are one, two, three, four hexes that have at least one garrison in play. As you can see at the capital, there are three garrisons on that spot, but this is still going to be one point for each. They currently don't have any legions over here, and lastly, there is just one faction type in the Imperial Graveyard, so that is going to give them two points plus four, or six points total for the Empire. So they go up to six. Next up, we will score Chaos, and they will get one point for every curse in play, one point for every horde in play, and two points for every faction in the Chaos Graveyard. Currently, there are one, two, three, four, five curses in play, so that's five points. There are also one horde in play, so that's one point. And lastly, there are two different factions in the Chaos Graveyard, because of course, the Empire is a faction, so that is two plus two, or four more points for the units they destroyed this chapter. All told, that means Chaos got 10 points total. And now we can return all units in the Legion and Chaos Graveyards back to their appropriate reserves. So the garrisons will go back over here, the blue player will bring this Spearsinger back into their area, and then the red player will get both these tribesmen and this Dead Eyes back into their supply. Alright, the players now get to score, and they will each get two points for every haven they have in play. They will also get points for special hexes they have havens on, and they can get one victory point for every five resources they pay. Now, these resources do not have to be the same, and it's important to note that you can spend resources and gift that victory point to another player. Now, that's not going to be happening right now. In general, this is a way for players to liquidate their resources right at the end of the game's final chapter. So we can see that red has two havens in play, and that means they will get four points there. And this is what the special hex icon looks like. Now, if a haven is on that spot, then that player will get those points. So red will get one point for that. And as you can see, this C tower does have one of those on it, but currently there is a horde on there, which means there are certainly no havens on the spot. So red will get two plus two plus one or five points, which will bring them up to seven. And then blue will get 2 plus 2 plus 1, or 5 points as well, which will bring them up to 12. Alright, that completes the scoring phase, and that means this chapter has come to a close. So we can move this token all the way up to the top, and then start the next chapter in the game. The first thing we have to do is reveal a new druid card. So we can flip this one over, and it says Faceless One. Now this is usable during the archery and clash rounds, and it says your enemy in this combat will lose one victory point, and this happens before damage, and only once per overall combat. Next up, we have to flip all of our face down cards back to being face up. Now we didn't actually see any of those so far in the game. Here is an example of a card that can be flipped. This says Frenzy. You can flip this in order to lose one skull, but gain one bolt during combat. Now, when this is flipped, it will then stay flipped until this part of the refresh phase in the next chapter of the game. After that, each player can regain all eight of their action points, which means we can simply slide these up to the top of our boards. After that, we have to discard all of the current items and deal out three new ones. So all of these are gone, and then these would be the ones we could choose from in the next chapter. After that, it's time to discard any remaining quests and deal three new ones. So this one is gone, and these would be the three quests we could work towards in the next chapter of the game. It's worth noting that some of these quests have an immediate effect. For example, this Imperial Spy says that immediately the Empire gains one victory point for each haven on the map, up to a maximum of seven. So that is going to happen right now. And there are currently four havens on the map. So that means the Empire gains four points, which brings them up to ten. We can now move on to the last part of the refresh phase, where we pass the first player marker once to the left. This means it will go from the red player over to the blue player. Alright, we can now move into the event phase of the chapter, and it says we have to add two threat to all Legion and Horde cards currently in play. This means we simply slide their clips up twice, so if the Counter of Omens hadn't suffered a couple of damage from the Empire during their activation, they would actually be up to six threat. It's worth noting that if the threat marker is at the top and more threat needs to be added, then that faction will gain one victory point for each threat that cannot be added on. We can continue with the event phase, and now the first player will draw and read the next event. So we can reveal the event associated with Chapter 2, and that one says, Long Live the Emperor. 
So we can focus in, and it says, The emperor is dead. Long live the emperor. With the sanction of the escaped empress, the governor of Azul declares himself the new leader of the last bastion of the empire. Next up, it says, For each player, we have to place one garrison onto an empty hex that does not have an X. Currently, there are only four options for that, and I figure we'll probably put the one down over here close to our haven and one over there closer to the blue player so we could try to deal with those. We can now move on to the bottom half of the event, and it says, And over the rooftops of Normgard, the new capital, hung the smoke of blacksmiths day and night, busily working to supply the legions with equipment. So we have to place two legions now with a threat of four on the capital, which means we have to randomly draw two legions from the top of this stack. Now they each have a threat of four, so we can take a clip and put that onto the four spot for each of them. And then we can take their associated figures and put them into the capital. Next up, we have to perform the immediate effects for all of these revealed legion cards. The warlock right here says the first thing we have to do is place his target. Now, every legion in the game has an associated target token, and when you place a target out, it has to go towards a player that is not currently targeted by a legion. Currently, neither of the players are a target, which means we can have the warlock target either player. And let's have the warlock target the red player. Now, what we have to do is place this target down onto a hex that has a red haven on it, and if there are multiple red havens, we put the hex down onto the one that has the least number of units. As you can see, there are two units with this haven and no units with that one, so this target will be placed right over here. Before we move on with the immediate effects for the Warlock, I would now like to discuss the differences between activating a Horde token and activating Legion tokens. We know these Horde tokens want to move no farther away from the capital, and they are going to attack havens as well as units. But when it comes to these Legion tokens, they are singularly focused on trying to get to their target. For instance, with the Warlock, when they activate, they are going to move so that they get closer to the Hex that has their target. And if there are multiple movement options for them, then they are going to move onto a Hex that has a Haven. If there are no options for that, then instead they will move onto a Hex that has the fewest number of enemy units. The next difference between the Horde and Legion activations is that when the Horde activates, they drop a curse down onto the Hex they were at before they move, and when the Legion activates, they drop a Garrison down onto their current Hex before they move out. So as you can see, this Warlock is going to be wanting to move towards this target, so when they activate, they are going to drop a Garrison down here into the capital before moving on. Now as you can see, the capital starts with three Garrisons in it, and as you can see, the capital has some special rules. It says if you would place a fourth garrison here, you place it on an empty hex with no X, or if there is none, then you reinforce another garrison. You do this instead of giving the Empire one victory point. Remember, normally when you try to place a fourth garrison, it just gives one point to the Empire. It's also worth noting that if there is no legion and no enemy units here, then you place one legion here, and this begins combat. That means if a player invades the capital and wipes out all of these garrisons, then they are going to have to fight a legion that pops out, and if you immediately defeat that legion, then another legion will spawn, and that will keep happening until there are no more legion cards left. So obviously, in this example, when the warlock activates and leaves the capital, we are going to have to put a garrison down onto a location with no X, or reinforce another garrison if there are no valid spots, so this might go here, and then the next time the Warlock activates, another garrison will be placed onto that spot. So in this case, that would be a level 2 garrison, as this Warlock continues to try and get towards their target. Now, if they enter the spot with their target and there are no opposing units, they will just destroy this haven. But of course, if there were units there, then a battle would happen. Now, if the Legion ends up winning that battle, then that will destroy the haven, and then they will need to place their target onto a new haven. Now, these legions will only ever target more havens of the faction that they were already going after, and they will place this target down just like when you normally put these down when the legion spawns, so you find a haven with the fewest number of opposing units. So that means that these legion are going to work their way trying to systematically wipe out the faction they are targeting until, of course, they get wiped out, which is something that we as the players need to try and make happen. Let's now move on with the Warlock's immediate effect, and it says that every player must pay one salt for each of their havens. We currently both have two, so each of us is going to lose two salts. 
After that, we must resolve the assassin's immediate effect. The first thing we have to do is place her target. In this case, they must target the blue faction because the red faction already has a target on them from a legion. Now, both of the blue faction's havens have no units on them, so we can choose which one is the target, and we figure we'll put this one right over there. Now, it's worth noting that if you need to place a target down for a new legion and all of the players have a target on them, then instead you put that new target down onto the capital itself, and that target will never move from that location. Next up, the assassin says that the player they targeted has to flip over their starting feats, and the assassin starts with an activation token on top of their card. This means the blue player has to flip both of their starting feats, and they won't be quite as good at completing quests for the next chapter in the game. At this point, we are not done with the event, because the next thing that it says is if there is currently no horde, we have to place one horde with a threat level of 4 onto any empty hex. Fortunately, there is a horde, so that is not going to do anything. And lastly, it says we have to place one activation token onto one horde card. Currently, there's only one horde to choose from. And now we can move on to the last part of the event phase. This says we have to place one activation token onto every horde and a legion card. And if this happened to be the final chapter of the game, then we would put two activation tokens down onto them instead of one. So we can place these out, and that means at the end of the next chapter, the Assassin is going to activate twice, and so is the Counter of Omens, of course, as long as they survive through the end of the next chapter. So I think these two have certainly made themselves more of a target. All right, we can now move into the build phase of the chapter, and the first thing that we each do is draw two feats from the top of our deck. We then keep one of them, and then we put the other one to the bottom of our deck, and we have to remember that we have a 10-card limit between our feats and our items. We can start with the red player, and that means that they get to choose one of these two. Well, we've already seen this one before. I showed it when I was talking about flipping, and the other one is Bloodlust. Both of these are usable during the clash phase, and this says that you can discard this to the bottom of your feet deck to roll the dice of your units that were destroyed here in this round. This happens after damage and only on the hex with your hero. Now this is only usable once, but it's a powerful effect, whereas this one could also be powerful turning a hit into a bolt. I think this one is actually better, so let's go ahead and put this one to the bottom, and then this can be added into the red player's hand. Over here, the blue player is also looking at their top two cards. This one says Ashforge, and it's always in effect. It reduces the cost of their younglings by one plunder. Uh, now, I haven't talked about the costs just yet, but you can see that the younglings cost two salt or two plunder, so that is a good discount. And the other one says that after combat, you can flip this over to exchange one youngling for an Oath Sworn. Now, the Oath Sworn are much more expensive overall, and they roll a red die instead of a blue die, and they think that this is what they'd like to go for. They can only use it once per chapter, but this discount feels less impactful considering three out of their five younglings are already out on the board. After that, players can now simultaneously build any units, towers, or walls from their reserve onto any of their havens. Remember, there is a maximum of five units per hex in the game. This also says if you have no haven in play, you choose one explored empty hex to then build into. With this in mind, we can focus down on the red player's area. The tribesmen that we saw used in the first chapter each cost one food to deploy. The dead eyes, which are archers, cost two salt. The wargs, which we haven't seen yet, cost three salt and two food, and those roll a red die. And then the troll, of which there is just one, costs five food and two salt, and it rolls the black die. Remember, that die does have a three skull option, and it's the only die in the game with no blanks on it. In addition to these units, the red player can also spend plunder to increase tower defenses as well as wall defenses on their havens. The way this works is for the tower, they spend one plunder, and they can place this tower piece down onto a haven that's on the board. It fits nicely right on top of it, and now if there is combat in the hex where that haven is, then an extra white die will be rolled in both the archery and clash phases. Likewise, over here with the wall defenses, that also costs one plunder, and that puts a wall around the haven, and it will add one blue die during each clash phase. Now, each haven can have at most one wall and one tower on it, and it is worth noting that the benefits provided by the wall and the tower only happen if there are at least one unit in that area to actually man the wall and the tower. If the haven has no units in it, and any enemy unit enters that spot, it will wipe that haven out without a battle.
Well, we can see the red faction only uses plunder for towers and walls, and not for any of their other units. Now, they do have to spend three plunder for their havens instead of two, but they have decided since they have two havens, they are going to spend four plunder to put a tower and a wall onto each. So they can place these down onto each haven. And now they've decided to deploy a warg. That is going to cost them two food as well as three of their salt. And then before they actually put this out, they can spend some more resources on more units. Now they have a bunch of food left over and a bunch of tribesmen that they can deploy. So they've decided to spend three food in order to place three tribesmen out. And then they're going to pay two salt to put a dead eye into play. After considering their options, they are going to put one more tribesman out, which will cost them one food. They do have to make sure to have enough food to actually command these units. Now, that is all the spending they want to do. Remember, they could get rid of three of these uh, resources in order to take one of any other. And it's also worth noting, at this point, the player can do a trade action to generate one salt, even though it's not currently the action phase. Now, they think they're pretty good with this, so they can deploy all of these units. And these must go down onto havens. They're going to put three tribesmen over here on their home territory. And then in this territory, they'll put a warg, a tribesman, as well as a deadeye. It looks like the red player is hoping to work their way into Dawnguard to try and wipe out this horde, as well as place a haven down in the next chapter. At the same time red is building, so is the blue player. And as you can see, their costs are quite different. For their younglings and spear singers, they have to spend two salt or two plunder each. Their oath sworn here is two salt and three plunder, and their single gigantic elephant koloth is four salt and three food. When it comes to towers and walls, their costs and benefits are the same though. Well, they've decided to spend four of their plunder in order to bring out two younglings. And then they've decided to bring in one spear singer for two salt, and they are going to build their koloth. So that is four plus two, or six salt total, plus they also have to spend three food, and that is something they have a lot of. Remember, they could spend their food at a rate of three to one to get something else if they wanted to, but they do like the idea of rolling that black die in combat. That's all the building they want to do, so they can bring these out onto the board. And they've decided to place these units into their home territory, and the Koloth into Torment. They are likely planning on commanding these units over here, and then moving that group of five out to potentially work on these garrisons, and potentially try to take care of skeletons as well. Now that each player is done building units, towers, and walls, we can move into the action phase of the second chapter of the game. And at this point, we have played through one entire chapter, of course, because I started the first chapter in the action phase. Now at this point, I will not be playing any more of the game. As you can see, if we were to play through this chapter, there is quite a bit going on with the players having many different units at their disposal, there being a couple of legions out here on the map, and lots of skeletons that the players need to take care of. At this point, I have now covered most of the rules to the game, which means this tutorial is coming to a close. I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Uprising. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongusgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.